All right, good afternoon, DerbyCon. How's everyone doing? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. My name is Daniel Bohannon. Bless you. Uh, my name is Daniel Bohannon, and uh, we're going to be looking at, um, this may surprise you, but we're going to look at PowerShell obfuscation today. So a little bit about me. Um, I work for Mandiant based out of the DC area. Uh, the past two years I've been doing instant response consulting. Actually recently shifted into uh, an applied research position there in Mandiant, so getting to try out crazy evasion, obfuscation, and detection ideas every day. It's really a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and yeah, let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, so a quick outline on this. So this is uh, an overview of, uh, of some, some previous PowerShell obfuscation techniques and then looking at a new tool um, that I put out called Invoke Cradle Crafter, um, which uses completely different obfuscation techniques and really is a couple, a couple points we'll look at that are quite different from anything in um, Invoke obfuscation, um, which is a, a year, it's one year birthday is like this Sunday, which is kind of crazy to believe here in this room. So it's really awesome to, to be back uh, amongst family here. So first I'll cover my motivation of why I continue to obsess over obfuscation. Um, and then I'll look at uh, the current state of uh, PowerShell obfuscation today, as well as the detection of that obfuscation. How well are we as an industry doing? Um, and then we're going to look at some cryptic cradles and some really weird ways to have PowerShell download remote content and execute it um, from, from a red and really heavily blue perspective as well. What kinds of things can we look for um, for that next to last point, actually detecting these cryptic cradles? And then we'll do um, a live demo of Invoke Cradle Crafter. So uh, a quick disclaimer, um, I, I've talked to a lot of people in the past year about PowerShell um, obfuscation in particular, and a lot of questions have been a common theme. Um, so I do want to just kind of set the stage up front. Um, I do not believe that blocking PowerShell is, not a, is a realistic option. It's totally not. PowerShell.exe is not PowerShell. System management automation.dll is PowerShell. I mean, blocking the host application of PowerShell.exe um, is really not an advisable solution, nor is it really a good solution. Um, that leads to the second point. Why did I say this? Well, PowerShell is not special. Noted blue teamer Jared Haight uh, mentioned this once, um, and he, what he meant by that was um, if an attacker is uh, sent your organization a phishing email and you enable the macro and it ran code and it happened to use PowerShell to download a garbage executable and app data and run, that's really not a PowerShell problem. That's a user received a phishing email, enabled macros, ran arbitrary code, and PowerShell just happened to be the weapon of choice to download that garbage commodity. Um, and so PowerShell's gotten lumped in and kind of been given a black eye in a lot of ways from the increased use of PowerShell and attacks when in most of those cases it's honestly just they're using it as a glorified wget to download something else. And PowerShell is way more awesome than that. Uh, and especially the security features that are built into third bullet point, PowerShell version 5 are stupid awesome. Um, really, really awesome. Uh, my advice and our advice to clients is get to PowerShell 5 as fast as you possibly can uh, and enable the logs and collect the logs and look at the logs. Um, these two resources down here, one is a blog post um, by my colleague Matt Dunwoody on really the benefits of these um, uh, updated logs in PowerShell. Um, and then if you haven't read the second resource, PowerShell Hearts the Blue Team is a white paper and blog post by the PowerShell team at Microsoft. It is an incredible resource continually being updated with all the amazing detection and prevention components built into PowerShell 5 that you definitely want at your organization. Um, and as Lee Holmes tells people, attackers typically aren't in the, you know, the habit of enabling this stuff for you, so you want to make sure you do that before you have to deal with these attackers. So why focus on PowerShell? Well, for me, um, especially in my time at Mandiant, seeing how heavily PowerShell is used at, at, at least one phase in the attack lifecycle. Um, it, it's present uh, on uh, Windows 7 and later by default. It's a, a native window sign binary. Um, typically people who do have app listening um, enabled are letting it go um, and aren't really scrutinizing what's being run by PowerShell. So it's being used a lot. Um, and it's really impossible to detect what's going on if you don't have PowerShell logs enabled or at the bare minimum command line process auditing enabled with arguments. So why do I obsess over more obfuscation? Well, um, so about two years ago I really started digging into PowerShell obfuscation um, and when it came to kind of collecting all my notes um, for the building of Invo, obfuscation, there's really a whole section that I, I kind of touched on in invoke obfuscation talks, but di it didn't have a good place in invoke obfuscation, and that was what are all the weird ways you can download um, and execute remote code. Um, invoke obfuscation takes any arbitrary PowerShell command or script and obfuscates it syntactically, but there's a lot of things where it has to do with just using completely different components in the first place for performing remote downloads, and so that's kind of what birthed invoke cradle crafter to really be like a living library of ways to to run really weird ways to download uh, remote payloads, and then also using a completely different set of obfuscation techniques that are not found in invoke obfuscation. 
So let's look at the current state of PowerShell obfuscation. So last year I released Invoke Obfuscation, which has four different layers of obfuscation. You have token layer, string, encoding, and launcher. Um, and just like a super 100 mile an hour walkthrough of what this looks like if you're not familiar with these layers of obfuscation. Um, so basically if we have an attacker command like at the top, and if as a defender we have these keywords at the bottom to detect um, this command, then what we can do is if, if an attacker starts to obfuscate things, like for example a URL is a string, so they could just concat that string, right? And if our detection at the bottom was based off HTTP being there, that's going to break that detection. So if an attacker modifies the command, we should also modify the detection at the bottom and remove that component. Trying to find the lowest common denominator. So as a defender, that's what I'm trying to do with all this obfuscation research is find what is the lowest common denominator, um, immutable if possible, that actually makes sense for a more robust detection. Um, download string. This is typically what we see attackers using, but download string is just one of many methods available in the net uh, in the .NET class of net.webclient. Um, what's interesting is that invoke obfuscation will take any method and just put tick marks in it or concatenate it or do stuff like that. However, invoke obfuscation will never substitute one method for another because it actually returns the payload in a different format. Download string brings it in as an expression or a string, but download data, for example, brings it in as a byte array. Um, and download uh, file brings it to disk, open read brings it as a byte stream. So there's more wrappers you have to put around that to convert it back to an expression before you invoke it. So with invoke cradle crafter, since I have all that context, then whichever of these you choose, it will add those additional wrappers to transform it back to an expression that you can invoke. Um, so uh, invoke obfuscation will look at this and say, okay, that's a method, so I can put single quotes around it, I can put double quotes around it, I can do one tick mark around it, um, I can do multiple tick marks around it because I'm escaping something that has no escapable meaning, um, and it will keep going from there. Net.webclient, we can do something similar. Um, when it comes to co commandlets, so invoke expression and new object are both commandlets. Um, so purely at a syntax level, you can obfuscate commandlets in PowerShell um, using uh, invoke obfuscation has these three options, just straight up putting tick marks in the commandlet name, um, encapsulating it with parentheses and treating it as a string, which you can, option number two, concatenate, or option number three, reorder with that dash F format operator and just kind of move all the pieces around. But what about some other options that we can do if we have more context like in invoke cradle crafter? Um, well, we can do things like use git command um, and say enumerate all the commands that are out there and return the one that is new object and then let me invoke that. Um, option number five is a PowerShell 1.0. is one of the many ways you can use PowerShell 1.0 to do that very same thing. However, we don't have to specify the full commandlet name, new object. We could do something like that and start to use wildcards and it will still return the single new object and invoke it. And for git command in this execution context automatic variable, we could obfuscate those two with one of a ton of different ways. And this is just a really simplistic example, but all of these ways that I've enumerated for each of these elements of the command, I've added into the tool to randomly select and obfuscate each of those. Um, so we'll just go with the tick marks for the sake of this example and keep going. Um, and the last part here is invoke expression. And as a defender, if you're not looking for invoke expression um, on the command line, then you're missing like a ton of low hanging fruit. Attackers love this uh, commandlet. Um, however, uh, invoke expression or its alias IEX, they're the most commonly, thing, commonly used um, elements, but there's other ways that you can produce the strings IEX and then get the result of invoke expression, um, like this one. So shell ID is an automatic variable in PowerShell. It literally is the string Microsoft.PowerShell. And so if you just say shell ID index 1 and index 13, that's the letter I, the letter E, you add a letter X, concatenate it together, and then dot, this is now IEX. And so the common theme here is when it comes to obfuscation um, of, of PowerShell code, if you can get any element to a string, then you're golden. You can concatenate it, chunk it up in variables, reorder it, reverse it, do whatever you want, and you're good. Um, so again, invoke obfuscation takes any commandlet, and it's never going to swap invoke expression for IEX. It's never going to swap invoke expression for something like this, concatenating of variable strings. But Invoke Cradle Crafter will. In fact, it has over 10 different kinds of invocation options that we'll look at in here in just a couple minutes. So that was, that was the, one of the four layers of obfuscation that exists today. Um, token layer obfuscation. The next one is string obfuscation. So basically take your whole command after we've done all this stuff to it and just treat the whole thing as a string and reverse it, concatenate it, any of this kind of stuff. Third one is encoding options. Um, you have your more normal things like ASCII hex octal. You could also shove PowerShell code into a secure string object. Um, or you could do some crazy things like 100% special characters or white space encoding, all that kind of stuff. And now the really nice thing about this is, um, remember I talked about how you need to get the PowerShell vibe very quickly? Well, all these string, string wrapping things, encoding things, 
um, in, in the next section we'll look at in launching, it's all recorded in the PowerShell logs. So if you have PowerShell 5 and have script lock, module logging, and hopefully transcription also enabled, you're going to see all of this information no matter how it's launched. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that all the tick marks and stuff and the token layer obfuscation is still something that's going to persist in those logs, but all the other layers, no matter how many they are, are completely unraveled in those logs, which is an incredible resource when it comes to investigating. Um, and these are some of the different options that you can use to launch PowerShell and invoke obfuscation. Again, basically creative ways to say, even if we're calling PowerShell.exe, we can actually pass in, we can pass in the commands as standard input or an environment variable such that if a defender is only looking for PowerShell.exe and its arguments and you can miss all the juicy details because they can be stored in parent, grandparent processes, unrelated processes, et cetera. There's a lot of ways you can get content into PowerShell without it showing up on PowerShell.exe's command line. So that's like a super brief overview of looking at kind of the invoke obfuscation style of PowerShell obfuscation. So what's the current state of, uh, of us as a community detecting PowerShell obfuscation? Um, Unfortunately, still not super great, but definitely a lot better than it was a year ago. Um, when it comes to writing pure signatures for the raw text, there are some tricks that you can do, but nothing is completely foolproof. Um, and uh, we've, have, we've seen a bit of invoke obfuscation in the wild um, by some commodity stuff, but then also more notably APT32, um, where the Vietnamese um, APT group, also known as Ocean Lotus, um, they like to wrap their commands in like a lot of layers of string obfuscation. Um, so I get some dirty looks in the office when those kind of payloads come across. I send it my way to decode. So joke, joke's on me. Uh, I, really, I really don't have any room to complain there, I suppose. One thing to keep in mind is that um, obfuscation is really just for um, testing your detection against um, like static analysis. It has nothing to do with heuristic-based detections, which as a defender means that maybe we should have both and really realize that the behavior of PowerShell doing this activity, no matter how much we obfuscate it, it's still going to do that activity. So writing detections both for static analysis as well as the behavior is actually really important and is a big component of what we'll talk about in some of these weird cradles when it comes to making network connections. How might some of these behaviors be very different than we would have initially expected? Um, AMSI is the uh, Microsoft's anti-malware scan interface. This is really, really cool and, and I think in some ways a bit misunderstood. It is an interface that AV vendors can uh, can basically register an interface with and get access, not just to PowerShell, um, but right now we'll look at the PowerShell section, right? Anything you have in PowerShell script lock logs, all the unraveling of every layer of obfuscation, um, that is then passed to any registered AV vendor that can then make a go or no go actual prevention decision based on whatever signatures they have against every layer of obfuscation. So it really allows any AV vendor to deep dive into all this crazy visibility that PowerShell 5 gives us and is really awesome. Um, the other thing, about a month after, um, after I released Invoke Obfuscation last year, um, uh, Lee Holmes right here wrote this awesome blog post called More Detecting Obfuscated PowerShell. Um, and he threw out some, some, some kind of nerdy math stuff about using things like character frequency analysis and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Lee seems like a really nice guy. And so it kind of struck up a cool friendship and chatted online back, back and forth a bit. Um, and it actually led to a really, really fun several months of research earlier this year um, into a, a framework called uh, Revoke Obfuscation, which we're actually going to be presenting on tomorrow as well. So in terms of kind of the landscape of detecting obfuscated PowerShell, we're really excited about the research that's come out of that and the results that we've been getting with that. Um, so I won't, I won't spill any more beans on that. But just to let the blue, the blue teamers out there know that I'm not like a total jerk. I, I, I've tried to kind of repent of, of all this, all this criticism of like, you're really screwing over the blue team and we don't really believe you when you say that you're still a blue teamer. So hopefully this uh, will change some people's minds. So let's look at the, let's look at the new cradles. Um, more is a combination of more plus four. I didn't know that initially. So it's also a good reason to put a cat picture in the slides. So I'm going to kind of break this down into three sections. Um, first, we just have, if you're not doing any like tick marks or any like syntax level obfuscation, you can use completely unobfuscated PowerShell code, but just use obscure stuff that people aren't, that defenders maybe aren't looking for um, to, to have really weird cradles. Matt Graber tweeted this a while back saying, um, if you're looking for a download string in your stagers, that's awesome, but what about IWR? Uh, which is an alias for invoke web request. And sure, you could say, oh, well, this is only available in PowerShell three or later. Well, attackers can figure out what system they're on, and we've seen attackers using this very commandlet, um, and we'll look at some of those as well. Um, and so I've kind of in the tool, and what we'll look at here is breaking out cradles into memory-based and disk-based cradles, and look at kind of some of the pros and cons of each of those. Next, we'll look at uh, token obfuscation and how we do it completely differently in Cradle Crafter versus Invoke Obfuscation, where you can take this same cradle, 
the same command we looked at in the previous slides, and turn it into something like this. And you'll not see a single concatenation, you'll not see a single tick mark, it's using a completely different style of obfuscation, which we'll dive into. And then we'll just look at, again, obscure invocation syntaxes. We need to invoke that code somehow. What are weird ways that maybe as defenders we're not looking for? So a quick overview of the different kinds of cradles. First, disk-based cradles. A lot of people don't really give disk-based cradles much of a thought because it's sexier to stay in memory, but a lot of defenders are more reliant on memory-based stuff. And so if you drop something to disk, like, maybe they're not looking there. And also there's a handy little thing called a profile script in PowerShell that you can just download your content there and then fire up PowerShell with zero arguments and it's gonna run everything in that profile script. And so there's a lot of interesting places that you can store PowerShell code on disk. And so I wouldn't completely overlook the disk-based cradles as a red teamer, but definitely not as a defender because like this is being used out there. So download file is one of the net.web client methods um, that we see used most often. You also have bits admin, um, which is a separate binary and technically it's deprecated, but it you know still works and so you can use that. You can also use PowerShell um, three or later's uh, start bits transfer to do, um, to basically use kind of the, the more official non-deprecated way of interacting with bits. One thing to keep in mind here, um, is that, uh, so BITS, the Background Intelligent Transfer Service, um, it actually requires a few more things before it downloads content just based on the way it chunks the data and works. So if you're trying to host a uh, stage a payload on say like Pastebin, um, it's not gonna work because it's gonna say, hey, when I went to request this file, it never gave me a size of how big the whole payload is. So I don't even know, like, I can't really deal with this. Um, so it really depends on what server you're hosting your payload on, thus the importance of testing your stuff. But the other interesting thing here is that you'll see the shield, the CLM shield, and that stands for Constrained Language Mode. Um, which is really, really awesome, basically, um, especially if you've done any work with like, uh, like Device Guard and basically um, kind of uh, locking down the commandlets that are available in a PowerShell session. That's what constrained, that's like a super generic high level uh, of what constrained language mode is. Um, and these, these work in constrained language mode. Um, so if you're on a system that is locked down this way, there are still plenty of ways you can download content to disk. So as a defender, if you have constrained language mode enabled, there are still ways to remotely download content natively in PowerShell, and we need to be aware of that as we're writing these detections. So that was disk-based. Now, if we look at the slew of memory-based uh, cradles um, that we've put together in this research, um, download string, again, is the most common. I won't touch on that. We briefly talked about download data and open read. Again, these first three are all methods of the net.web client class, um, returning as a byte array and a byte stream. Uh, invoke web request and invoke rest method are th PowerShell three and later, but again, these are both memory only and they will work in constrained language mode. Um, invoke web request has a lot more aliases that a lot of people kind of leave out, especially that w get and curl, um, and we've seen attackers privy to using both of those. Um, the net.http web request class, this one's really cool um, because you can actually uh, instantiate an object of this class um, in PowerShell two all the way up. Um, you'll see some of the, for, for a download string, there's ways that you can basically instantiate that class um, in PowerShell three or later, but I haven't found a great way to do it in two. That's why this option here is kind of cool, because you can go all the way back to two, which means if as a defender, you'll notice there's no new object command anywhere in this. So if you're using something like 4103 module logs and looking for new object parameter bindings, you'll never see that here because it's not doing a new object, because you're calling it straight in .NET. Um, this one is strictly for the lulls. If you are betting money on whether this will work, you're gonna lose this bet like maybe half the time. I just spent way too much time trying to make it more robust to not put it in the tool. So this is for kicks and giggles. But if as an attacker you have access to a system and you open up Notepad, instead of opening up a local file, you type in a URL, say, to GitHub Mimikatz, right? Then you hit enter, Notepad's actually gonna fetch that payload. Um, now why does this matter? As a defender, um, let's say that we're somewhat humble and say, you know what, there's probably a lot of ways we don't know how to catch this malicious activity. Why don't we just look for PowerShell making a network connection period? Let's have that be another layer of defense. Um, well, in this case, PowerShell never made a network connection, Notepad did. Um, but this, is, this requires interactive access, right? Uh, not quite. What we could do is we could use send keys and basically simulate the keystroke such that we can start the Notepad process non-interactively and then send the key control O to open. We basically start, start the process and then move it off the screen by changing the coordinates. Um, send uh, control O to bring up the open prompt, type in the URL, send enter, um, and then wait a couple seconds and send a control A to select all, control C to copy, and then the final portion of the PowerShell command is ripping it out of clipboard and executing it. Again, PowerShell never making a network connection, but Notepad making the network connection. Um, a more realistic way and cleaner way, and one that maybe you could actually make some bets on whether it'll work or not, is using com objects to have other binaries make network connections. And the reason I'm really harping on this is, again, because you can have something 
not called PowerShell, making a PowerShell connection. And before we even dive into this, if you think that attackers aren't just renaming PowerShell to something else like Firefox.exe and then running it, then you're dead wrong because they're doing that. So even as you go back and think about your detections, are your detections founded on process name equals PowerShell.exe and these arguments? Because if it is, then a simple rename of that binary might actually screw your detections really, really hard. So as you kind of step back and say, are these arguments solid enough to ignore the fact of whatever the process is named. I um, mean, there's a lot of different ways you can approach kind of renaming attacks, but that's not, not the purpose of this talk. Um, but again, we shouldn't just fixate on PowerShell to actually making a network connection being the only way of evil. Like, there's a lot of weird ways you can pawn off connections onto other processes. Um, and, and that's what COM is doing here. So basically COM saying, let me, let me uh, create a WinWord Excel, i.e. Um, Internet Explorer uh, process hidden to the user and use that to actually make the network connections. And what's really cool about that uh, is that, like for Internet Explorer, Notepad making network connections should be a big red flag, but Internet Explorer, that's, that's its MO. That's what it's supposed to do, and you get the benefit of its default proxy settings and everything else in that user's Internet Explorer session. Um, the last two are um, really interesting. So PowerShell is, um, PowerShell really doesn't discriminate. So if you're like, man, I really love my C sharp, PowerShell's like, I'll run your C sharp for you, come on. Um, and so what you can do is just inline, put in your C sharp code, and then use this add type commandlet. Now what this is gonna do is it's gonna compile the C sharp code, but the interesting part is it's compiling it on the system that it runs, right? So if as an attacker, this is my payload and I run it on your target system, that target system has to compile the C sharp code. Um, and we'll look at some of the artifacts that comes out of that, but basically you're gonna see artifacts of CSC and CVT res for the compilation of C sharp code. So if you don't want all that noisy stuff happening on the target system, then you could just pre-compile that locally, um, compile it uh, into a DLL, then read it in as a byte stream, and then just load that byte stream on the target system, and you have no compilation done on the endpoint. Um, and the benefit from a stealthy perspective is you have no compilation on the endpoint, um, but from a defensive perspective, you also have no compilation on the endpoint. So even though there are good indicators around that compilation, and it really depends on if that's normal in your environment or not, uh, which I guess is an obvious statement. I'm not trying to say baselining is easy, but there are some things that in your environment may be super uncommon and be a really high fidelity indicator, and in others it may not be. And that's just where it comes down to testing uh, your own data and seeing is this a good indicator in my environment. So that was kind of the two, the, kind of the two genres of Cradle, uh, memory-based and disk-based. So when it comes to token obfuscation, let's look at, let's look at a couple options here. So again, we're taking the exact same uh, attacker command that we had before. Um, and so download string is, um, is a method. It's a method of the net.web client class. Um, and really, in this case, we want to find another way to produce the string download string. And if we can get that, then we can put it into the command, right? So one thing we could say is, okay, let's just create a, a, a net.web client object. And let's enumerate all the possible options, all the possible methods with this object. So we can do that with um, .psobject.methods. That's just one way. And you'll see here's all the overloaded definitions of, um, uh, for that object. You could also pipe it to get member and get very similar results, just slightly different format. Um, and both of these are options in the framework. You can choose between either one. Um, but for the sake of this example, let's just stick with the psobject.methods. So now when we do this, um, we could just do something like, okay, say, uh, enumerate all these methods and return the one where the, where the object's name is like download string. Um, and as you can see, we have, uh, we have two overloaded definitions here. And then all we want really is the name of the single thing. So this whole string now produces the result in string of download string. Um, and so there are other ways that we can obfuscate this, right? So that download string never shows up in the first place. Um, so this is actually a screenshot from the code. We, any of these um, wild-carded substrings will actually return just download string. So we'll just choose one of those. And then we replace that in the command. So now this command continues to work because all that red text is going to result in download string. And so the invoke cradle crafter really relies on this like multi-layer deep uh, substitution obfuscation for a lot of different data types. Again, anything that we can get into a string, then we can do this kind of obfuscation. And if you notice this dot invoke in blue, this is only necessary in PowerShell 2. 
PowerShell 3, you don't need that dot .invoke to continue the command. In the tooling, in both Invoke Obfuscation and Cradle Crafter, I include that dot .invoke by default, just so whatever system you want to test against, it works. But as a defender, some people have said, well, that dot .invoke is really awesome because it often, you know, persists if you don't do multiple layers of obfuscation. Well, a savvy attacker is just going to remove dot .invoke. So please don't build your detection solely based on that because it's not necessary in PowerShell 3 or later. Um, but I'm all for low-hanging fruit, so uh, you best believe I'm looking for it. Um, new object. So again, instead of just putting tick marks and concatenating this, we can basically say git command new object. So again, git command is used to enumerate all the available objects uh, or uh, all the available um, commandlets or function names um, that you have on that system um, currently imported. Um, so um, again, instead of uh, w basically what's returned is an object itself. Um, and we can pass that to invoke expression and it'll convert it to a string to invoke it. Or we can use the dot or ampersand invocation operators um, to invoke the object that comes back. Um, and again, git command, we have several options here. We can use its alias of GCM um, or its unofficial alias of command. So we'll just go with command in this case. And then for new object, these are the options again, um, randomly selecting these different uh, wildcarded substrings to produce new object in this git, con in this git command uh, invocation. So this now becomes new object. Um, and again, for, for all of these, just like with a token layer obfuscation, um, even, um, even with the PowerShell logging unwrapping all the different layers of like strings and encodings and stuff like that, you're still going to have to deal with this in script lock logs. It's going to look just like this on the command line and in script lock logs. Where it is not affected is in module logs, the 4103. And so in that case, you're actually going to see a parameter binding of new object um, without this crazy obfuscation. You'll see that uh, net that web client being the parameter that's bound to that. So again, the, the logging in PowerShell 5 is just insanely awesome. Um, it just may not be all in the exact log that you think is there. So all the evidence is there, it's just spread out in multiple places, and so it makes it a little more difficult to piece them all back together, but the evidence is totally there. And it's important as we go through and test these cradles to find, okay, like, like I'm putting this emphasis on these detections in the script lock logs and these in command line argument logs, but these are things I should typically never see in module logs in my environment. So how many, what kind of parameters should I ever expect to see um, bound to new object in my environment? And like, just take all that data and query it out and say, okay, anything other than this I want to know about. So there's all these little pieces you can focus on just to kind of set these, these landmines for whatever an attacker might trip over um, unbeknownst to them. Now the interesting thing here is um, we just obfuscated new object. But as you'll see, in the beginning of the command, we only had one instance of new object. But since we obfuscated download string, we actually introduced another new object. Um, and so I spent insanely too much time on this, but I wanted it to work such that um, these are all encapsulated in tags, so that if you change any single piece of the command, if ever that is represented later in the command or previously, like in this case, it will replace both of those. Um, so it's like several layers of tagging to make this work, but basically it persists in all the different places in which that commandlet exists. Um, here's another randomly generated PowerShell 1.0 syntax for retrieving new object. So as you can see, there's just a lot of different options there, and this is that execution context um, variable. So at the very beginning you can see it's that GV is git variable, that E asterisk ONT, that's execution context, that's one of the random substrings to produce that, and then the dot value, so that's just dollar sign execution context dot, and then we keep on going from there. Um, so with, with invoke obfuscation, um, it, it's kind of funny because there's so many levels of it that everyone I try to randomize as much as possible. Um, and that, that's good and bad. And it's bad if, like for me, for the few times I'm actually using it to produce like an obfuscated payload for something our red team is doing, let's say, um, then in the back of my mind, I know all the options under the hood, but it may take me 10 iterations to get to the exact right combination of what I want. So when it came to writing Invoke Cradle Crafter, since it was a, a lot more constrained data set, I really wanted way more control over every single one of these components that I could. And you'll see that in the tool in a second. However, there are some pieces that I really could care less which options are produced because there are so few. It's like, for example, where object and like. Um, every time you uh, run an obfuscation option, for the overall command, it will randomly select one of these. Um, so you don't, you can't pinpoint exactly which like you want, whether you want like or case like or in, uh, case insensitive like. Um, those will just randomly be selected. Um, th this one, this, this, I remember the day where I realized that dollar sign underscore is literally just a variable. It's an automatic variable called underscore. And there's, I knew there are many different ways to extract a variable name, but dollar sign underscore is, was a, a 
was interesting in a lot of detections I'd worked on. I realized, holy crap, you can just call this in like a thousand different ways because it's just the name of a variable. Um, and so here's just a quick slide listing several different ways you can basically extract the value of a variable. And uh, you best believe these are all options in the tool. Randomly select um, these every iteration. Um, on, on top of this, since we're not taking arbitrary commands or scripts, we're basically just saying, you know, hand me your remote destination of your IP address or your domain where you have your remotely hosted payload. Um, and then if you want some post cradle commands, you can hand me that as well. But the rest of the context is handled within the tool. Because for each cradle, there are very particular orderings that you're allowed to do based on setting, setting commands and variables um, and setting up objects and stuff like that. So you, another component of the tool is basically the arrangement of all the pieces of the command as well as things like chunking it up into smaller variables and using things like logical variable names like the first example, DS for download string or illogical variable names with illogical randomized ways of setting and extracting those variable values. And so the third option, again, we've looked at memory-based and disk-based cradles just from a big picture perspective, the different ways to obfuscate um, all the different tokens in, in a, a really different way than what we've done before, and now obscure invocation syntaxes. Um, again, invoke expression and IEX are the most common ones that we see attackers using. But we briefly looked at option number three of git command. We did that for the new object um, example. There's also the git alias or gal, which is doing the exact same uh, concept, but instead of working against the full name of the commandlet, you're only working against the alias name. So in this example, we're doing git alias on iex, and the i asterisk x returns to just iex, and that's how that works. Um, diving into PowerShell 1.0 syntax. I've said this several times um, before to other people. PowerShell 1.0 is so, um, it, it's, it takes, I'm happy with the improvements in PowerShell because I can do so much with so little code. From a defender's perspective, however, if an attacker is using this really gnarly PowerShell 1.0 syntax, there's a good chance maybe I'm actually not looking for it in the first place. So that execution context automatic variable is a really great example of that. There's just insanely powerful stuff you can do with that that a lot of defenders just aren't looking for, period. Um, and so I really wanted to make it a point to put this in here to expose people to the options here and to really be able just to iteratively generate randomized payloads and test to see are my detections robust enough to detect all these different components. Um, invoke command ICM, this is expecting a PowerShell um, uh, script um, instead of an expression itself, or script block instead of an expression, but you can always convert a script block to an expression um, and pass it into IEX if you want to. Or, um, or, sorry, you can take an expression and convert it to a script block and then use ICM in this case. Um, Matt Graber had this, this idea in, in talking several months ago. He said, why don't you just create a PowerShell run space, add the content to it, then invoke the run space. Um, and so that's what the option number seven is. Um, concatenated IEX, this is undoubtedly the most fun um, part of the project that I had, so I'll come back to this in one second. Let's cover the last three. Invoke as workflow. I've actually never seen this one used in the wild, but it's just so freaking cool. PowerShell three or later, uh, it's basically like invoke expression, but it contains it within a workflow, so if you have post-cradle stuff you want to do, you have to make sure that's all, uh, inv uh, all invoked inside that workflow, but still really cool. Um, the last two are for disk-based cradles, and so a lot of people, um, Maybe the most times when you see PowerShell invoking a PowerShell script on disk, it's just saying PowerShell-file or doing something like git content to read it and then invoke it in memory. Um, you can just straight up dot source, just like you would any binary on disk, and it knows, hey, this is a PowerShell script, let me run it. Or you can use import module or IPMO um, to basically import that code and, and run it as well. So these are options, invocation options in the, uh, in the memory-based cradle section. So going back to concatenated IEX. Um, the, the very last uh, update that I made to invoke obfuscation back, well, I guess that's the next to last update now, back in January or February was basically adding some of these random ways to piece together IEX and invoke expression, um, like this right here. So the comspec variable, um, the fourth, 26th, and 25th um, index of that will produce the strings IE and the X, so I can join it back together and invoke it. Same, we already looked at the shell ID examples. So these are both IEX. Um, however, um, you'll see the elements in red. Those are all hard-coded before an invoke obfuscation, but those are all just environment variables or automatic variables. So we could do something like that, for example. And again, dig into all the even deeper layers of whenever I see a variable, then I can extract the value through any of these randomized syntaxes. Or whenever I see an environment variable, I can do all of these. Um, and so I basically added in um, all those components um, for any time we see environment variables or regular variables. And then the question marks at the bottom is the last piece, which is just... I mean, again, it all comes down to I'm just finding weird ways to use strings and pull strings out of places I can count on being consistent on an, uh, a target system um, 
with, with pretty high fidelity. Um, and so this next part comes into play, where it's, which is basically, um, it's actually two tick marks. It's just an empty string. You can have any string, really. And I'm just saying, if I have a string, what are properties of the string? If I just pipe it to get member, I can see here's all the methods that are in this string. And if you notice, one of these is called index of, which when I see that, I see it very conveniently has the letters I, E, and the X all in the name, which is fascinating. Um, so if I just drill down on that and say string dot index of, then I'll see all the overloaded definitions. And then if I just cast that to a string, I get one nice string with tons of I's, tons of E's, and tons of X's. Um, so you may see where I'm going with this. Basically, if I just take the 0th, 7th, and 8th uh, index of that huge blob of data, then that produces the string IEX. Um, and so what I did uh, was I took, I just, I just drilled down into the string and basically wrote a script to enumerate every single string method and all the ones that had I's, E's, and X's. And then I went through and found every single index that matched that I and the E and the X across several different operating systems. Um, and this is a, a screenshot of the code there um, because I'm just completely insane when it comes to wanting to be thorough about indexes. And the whole reason is, again, as a defender, even for myself, I don't want anyone getting the idea of saying, okay, let me just look for 0, 7, 8, comma, and I'm good. That's totally not the case. And the whole point is I don't want anyone to kind of think they're easy, really easy wins here, and to think differently about detecting PowerShell, detecting obfuscated PowerShell in this case. Which is what we're going to look at right before the demo here. How do we actually detect this stuff? Again, if you're a blue teamer in the house and you haven't thrown anything at me yet, you might be thinking about doing that as soon as we're done with this presentation. But there is hope. And I got a lot of um, uh, criticism slash really positive feedback saying, dude, you really need to do more for the blue team because it's kind of frustrating because you get to spend all this time researching this stuff and the rest of us have to just kind of deal with the crap you just came up with. So. In doing this research, I really wanted to make it very practical for blue teamers to say, what are all the artifacts? Like, I throw out some of these ideas of how you can detect this stuff, but really, how can I expect to go back through all these slides and, and find all these pieces? Well, why not just bake it all into the tool itself? So that when you're looking at examples, you can see right there, what are the artifacts? What are the behaviors? What are the, some of the other things I can start to look for to have a fighting chance at detecting this? So first of all, network connections. Um, in all these different cradles, sometimes PowerShell is not making the network connections. If you're using the bits, then you're actually SVC host is making the network connection or whatever that remote uh, IP is. Um, for the comm stuff, you might expect Word, Excel, IE, they make the internet or the, uh, the network connections. When it comes to SYN keys and Notepad, you actually see both Notepad and SVC host making like a lot of network connections depending on the size of the payload. So that's kind of interesting. Um, Parent-child process relationships. Um, th there's been a lot of uh, talk in this past several months about basically how to totally break that parent-child process chain. So something to keep in mind, this is not foolproof, as most things in security, but there's still a ton of low-hanging fruit um, just when it comes to what are normal parent-child process relationships I'd expect to see or not see in my environment. And in the cases of this, we have, again, if, if in your PowerShell payload you're calling bits admin, then PowerShell spawning bits admin. Um, when it comes to all the comm stuff, comm is just absolute nastiness. If you're not following uh, Matt Nelson or Casey Smith, they've done a lot of awesome research and continue to do a lot of research in comm objects. And one of the nasty, um, one of the nasty components is it really just screws your parent-child process chain because SVC host, the existing SVC host is the one that actually spawns these child processes. Um, but uh, there, there is a light at this tunnel when it comes to, at the end of this tunnel for this, because there are some really small ways you can kind of pair, hey, PowerShell, even though PowerShell didn't spawn iExplore, how can we actually tie that activity back together? And so we'll look at that in a second. Um, and as I mentioned before, when it comes to like inline scripting, um, you'll actually see PowerShell spawn CSC for the compilation of C Sharp code um, and then CBT res. VBC also, this is, I really don't see this nearly as often, but this is just if you're running inline VB script in PowerShell, which you can totally do, it's using VBC to compile that on the target system. Um, event logs, besides your command line argument logs and basically anything that PowerShell logs, um, the, there's actually bits uh, logs that will log all this nice stuff for you. Um, so that's fun. Um, also, most people, when they use bits, they don't actually specify a name for the bits job. So you'll see weird things like your bits, bits job and stuff like that. So um, some of those kinds of things are interesting also. Um, and I'm not saying this for red teamers to go and start destroying this evidence. I'm saying it for blue teamers to start looking for this evidence. So take that for, uh, for, for whatever you want to make with it. Um, DLL is loaded. 
Um, so I said earlier the com object stuff is really frustrating because it actually breaks that parent-child process relationship. Well, if you have PowerShell creating a com object for Internet Explorer, then it's actually going to load ieproxy.dll. This is just one example of like, hey, this is a weird DLL that perhaps is extremely uncommon in my environment. This may be a good indicator to see some of these com shenanigans going on. Um, the, the other one that's really, really awesome is this Razman DLL and RazAPI32.dll. Um, and these are both located in System32, and basically it's the Remote Access Connection, connection Manager. And when you have PowerShell using net.webclient to make um, successful network connections, um, then it actually loads these DLLs. Now, where might you find this? Well, if you're using something like Sysmon and you're looking for image load events, you could look for PowerShell loading these DLLs. And it might happen a lot in your environment, or it might not happen much at all. Um, and in cases where it's really uncommon, it's an amazing indicator for a couple of reasons. One is you can look for it um, historically by looking at prefetch files. Again, if it happened in the first 10 seconds of the PowerShell.exe execution, it's going to be in the access files list in the prefetch file for PowerShell. Um, What's really fascinating about this is it actually creates these two registry keys for any binary that loads these DLLs to make this network connection. And it's this tracing registry key. Um, and these are really awesome because a lot of environments aren't using PowerShell to, to remotely download content. And so if that's the case, systems that are getting popped and using PowerShell to download the second stage, then these registry keys are sitting there for you. Um, AppCompat is also a great resource um, when you're looking for like um, uh, sequencing of uh, binary executions. Um, and so in the case of compilation of C-sharp code, you look for app compat values where you see PowerShell, CSC, CVT, res, and that's a really nice kind of threesome indicator of like, hey, some C-sharp was just run on this system. This may be of interest. And, and it may sound like, well, who would run C-sharp and PowerShell? What kind of demented mind might do that? Well, attackers love just using a C-sharp shell code loaders and hosting that in PowerShell. And so that actually happens quite a bit. Um, quite a few groups will use uh, C-sharp shellcode loaders and tool attack frameworks will do the exact same thing as well. So this is actually a really cool indicator in my opinion. And then cache temporary internet files. So a lot of these memory-based cradles, like, like you know, the, the lols with notepad or some of the comm stuff, technically it's not completely memory only because since you're using something like Internet Explorer, it's actually going to have that file hit disk and temporary internet files just from how it works in caching files. Um, so as a defender, what this means is that there's some really awesome wins if these weird cradles are being used sitting in your temporary internet files and some of those temp files. So again, thinking about how can I run UR rules to start to look for PowerShell scripts sitting in temporary internet files, there's a lot of really solid wins to be had there. And you'll also see like link files like with the actual um, URL for the payload and then sometimes like the entire script just sitting right there in those temporary directories. So really cool stuff there. And now for a quick demo. And as I say always, please do not use this tool for evil. I trust you have full express written consent from whichever environment you're using this tool in. So basically all you do is just import the module for Invoke Cradle Crafter. And then run it. And as you know, I love ASCII art. And so this is basically just obfuscating um, a command there to get to the, the final payload. You can actually run that bit.ly link for ASCII art. Totes legit, I promise. Um, so if you've used invoke obfuscation, you'll see it's very, very similar um, in terms of kind of the layout. Um, so uh, basically, I really like colors, and so anything in yellow basically takes you to a new thing, like a new page. So like, for example, tutorial. We can just type in tutorial, and it'll take us there. So yellow takes you to a new thing, um, and green actually does something. It actually obfuscates something or sets the value. So in this case, all we need to do is supply um, the remote location of whatever thing we want the cradle to download and run. And we do that with a set URL. So we're just going to do set URL. Now I have a local web server stood up. We'll just do derby.ps1. So now that's set. Um, and at any point you can type show or show options and it'll show you kind of your configuration of what you've done up to this point. So at this point we've set the URL um, and, and that's about it. So we can see our memory and disk options here. So if we type disk, then those are our options there. You'll notice anytime there's any kind of restriction, like PS3 or you know only or greater, I have that in bright red. So it's like very, very obvious that this will not work on PS2. So we'll just go back and we'll go back into our memory section. So here are all the cradles um, that exist today um, in this section. And you can see several are PowerShell 3 or later. But let's just look at the first example, which is uh, what we're calling PS web string, which is the exact same example we looked at um, using the net.web client. So we're going to PS web string. And anytime you enter the new context of a cradle, or you enter the context of a new cradle, you'll see it has these headers here. The name of this cradle, a brief description about what it does, and then things like compatibility, like dependencies. Like, again, if you're using the Atomic Cell 
what dependency is that Excel is on the system. So maybe if you're popping a server, it might not be something you want to put a lot of faith in. Um, and then foot, uh, footprint, is this memory based only or is it actually going to have some components that are hitting temporary internet files? And then lastly, indicators and artifacts. Um, and, and again, this is, this is just the opportunity that I've had over the, over the past several years to be able to work a lot of really interesting investigations and see a lot of this stuff that perhaps I'm now starting to take for granted. It's like the community could really benefit from seeing a lot of this stuff in one place to say, okay, if an attacker runs this kind of a cradle, what are some of the artifacts I need to make sure I'm looking at um, to have a fighting chance for detecting this? Um, and so the indicators and artifacts kind of go hand in hand. Um, so again, in this case, indicators being these two DLLs, well, artifacts where you could see if these DLLs were loaded historically would be prefetch files and these uh, registry tracing keys. Um, and so you'll see that change for every single command you go into. So we have several options here. We can go into the rearrange. Um, and default is just kind of a one-liner as best we can. Um, we can go to multivariable and it will use logically named variables and, and logical kind of setting and getting syntax using the dollar sign. Or we can do completely random. So let's do random variable names like two and E9 and let's use randomized syntax to set and get those variable names. And as you'll see here, Anytime you make a change, and I spent insanely too much time doing this, it highlights it in bright yellow using like layered tags. Um, and any, any data that you put in, like the URL, will show up in blue. So that you always know, here's the part that I contributed, and this is, remains hard-coded in the tool, uh, in the results, and then all the yellow stuff is what just changed this last iteration. So a lot of people have said, why don't you just obfuscate the URL? Like it's stupid to have this tool and the URL is still in plain text. It's like, well, I don't know if you realize this, but you could just take this result and then run it through invoke obfuscation to do any additional obfuscation you want. So the whole point was just to show substitution obfuscation and to provide one place to house all the indicators and artifacts for really obscure download cradles. Um, so again, we can drill down. Uh, remember I said that I really wanted to have more control over obfuscating very specific parts of the command. So this gives you that kind of control. So a new object is there by default. What we can also do is use the git command. It's kind of off the screen. We can use GCM. And you'll see every time we do this, it's going to be something different. So um, it'll use different substrings and stuff like that. We can also use PowerShell 1.0 syntax. And again, get something a bit different every single time. Um, sometimes it gets pretty gnarly pretty fast. Um, we do the same thing with methods. We can go in and obfuscate any of those um, using the enumeration with get member or psobject.methods. Um, and then we can go in to invoke and choose whatever invocation that we want. Um, by default, I don't put any invocation on here, just in case you want to build your payload and then just run it just to download the content in memory or in the tool to say, okay, this actually did download the content, but I don't want to pop a shell in my box here. I just want to make sure that everything is working. Um, and so you'll see the, all the options here. Again, some of the PS1s, uh, the PowerShell 1.0 syntaxes can get like really, really crazy and verbose. Uh, but my personal favorite still is the uh, concatenated IEX and just looking at some of those things. Um, probably just because I spent too much time on those indexes. But uh, if you're lazy, you can just go to all one and let it do all this stuff for you and randomly choose the ordering um, at every level to produce really, really different cradles. And at any point, you could just type test or exec and run it and see if it worked. And as you see, this is the payload that we had. Um, and so it worked. And just before the end here, you'll see some of these actually get really crazy really quickly, like the com object IE. A lot more info here um, on the cradle itself, but a ton more components that you can modify. And again, if you just wholesale do all of these and you can get some really, really crazy options. And my personal favorite um, is the PS compiled C sharp one. And actually, the, um, all, all the levels of uh, navigating this tool are completely regex friendly as well as CLI friendly. So you can also just go to show options and go to the top and I'll show you here's exactly what to do from a CLI perspective to do all this non-interactively. Um, but if we go to PS compiled and just throw a wild card in there, it'll resolve. And what this is actually going to do is it's going to do your C sharp inline script and it's going to compile it on your system and then end with this nice byte array um, doing some compression here for all the adjacent zeros that are there and then um, let you do this all very cleanly without having any compilation on the target system. So closing comments. Um, again, PowerShell is amazing. It's like the, the sexiest sexiest scripting language when it comes to a security and usability perspective. It's awesome. I'm a huge fanboy. Um, as a defender, upgrade to PowerShell 5 as soon as you possibly can and enable logging, increase the default log size and like get those logs off your endpoints to a centralized location and actually like look at them. Even if it's like, even if it's starting with a cron job and a grep, like look for a thing, find a scenario, find a cradle and say, I will detect when this happens because of this data source I have. It's all about small wins and building up those stories of here are the wins that we accomplished this week. 
Um, expand your detection to detect maybe some of these additional artifacts we talked about. These are really, really valuable, even outside of the world of PowerShell, but let's start there. Um, and then uh, break all assumptions about what's possible in terms of PowerShell syntax and even behaviors. Again, PowerShell doesn't have to be the one making a network connection. Like, that blew my mind when I first thought about it, but it's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. But, like, wrapping that around as you're building out your detections is really important. Also, accepting you're going to miss stuff. We miss stuff all the time because we're humans. And there's this weird culture of, like, shame if we like ever admit that we missed a thing. And it's like, it's important, especially to talk about our failures. Here's a detection idea that really sucked and we can all learn something from that. And so sharing your wins and your failures is like a really important thing that I think our community um, could, could really benefit from. Um, and so hopefully you uh, got some of that from this talk and just know that I'm uh, on Twitter and you can reach out to me and, and talk about this kind of stuff. I'm always happy to help. Uh, really like to thank all the awesome people I get to work with at Mandiant and the people who have mentored me and encouraged me and even the people outside the industry, people like Lee Holmes and others who are just like really inviting and like completely open with their time and sharing their expertise with me. Uh, it's just, it's a really awesome community and really uh, thankful to be a part of it. And then lastly, my wife Paige for putting up with yet another year of PowerShell research and development. It's insane that she puts up with this, but she's really, really supportive and I wouldn't be here without, um, without her. So. Thank you very much. That's the end of this talk. Thank you. And I realize I'm at 50 minutes, but I'll, I'll be right